if you don't like who you are or how you are or where you are, one of the easiest things to do is to plug into something else. Mass movements project the anger on the other rather than the self. When you see in copywriting, it's not your fault. I think that's amateurish, right? Ideally, you want the prospect to come to that conclusion on their own. But either way, right, we're taking the anger off of the self. And that is incredibly important, right? We're dealing with a self-esteem problem very often when we're in the marketing game. So it's not enough for many prospects out there for you to prove that you've done it. A lot of people will feel like they are not capable of getting a specific outcome. So in order to sell someone on a product, a program that helps deliver a specific result, they have to believe that it's not only possible for them, it is probable. Hence, moving someone from possible to probable is part of the game of marketing. And I hope that makes sense. Hello, I am excited about today, although today we're gonna to be talking more about true believer and anything that is timeless as it relates to human psychology is really a useful distinction and useful understandings as it relates to marketing, right? I also got some feedback and I wonder, I'd like to get your feedback on this feedback because I think it might be really valid and it could help me quite a bit in helping you guys. A friend of mine, Masha came over and the three of us were talking and Masha has watched some of these live streams and she said that when I'm present, I'm like, I draw people in, but that she can tell sometimes my brain goes somewhere else and that I'm not present, like I'm in my head. And that, that from her perspective, because she's done a lot with Landmark and things like that, she can notice those differences and also recognize that it doesn't work as well for me when I'm broadcasting here. Just really curious because part of the reason for me doing these live streams, in addition to making an impact for you guys, making a difference, being here, helping you answer your questions, which is why I always stress that we should make these as much of a dialogue and not a monologue, is that I wanna get better and better at doing these. That then opens up more options for me because I know, I have a lot of people that I could collaborate on many of the different social media platforms that would greatly expand my reach. And I haven't really pressed my foot down yet on the accelerator of that because I feel like I got to get better. I'm looking forward to seeing what your answers are as far as feedback to me on how I can be doing better and whether it's about being present. But what I can show you is I have a post-it here that says be present. I have a post-it here that tells me to be present. I have a post-it over here that tells me to be present. And so I'm just trying to remind myself, stay in the moment, Rich, stay in the moment. Anyway, let's see what the comments are. Hello, Rich. How were you introduced to Werner Her Erhard? Did you attend S seminar or Landmark Forum? I first came across Werner's stuff years ago, studied it, went to Landmark, but interestingly enough, I was the only person in the room who actually just went and signed up. I wasn't recruited by someone who had gone. And I have studied pretty much everything that I could get my hands on of Werner's. Werner was giving a presentation once at NYU. Kim and I went to that. That was quite a bit of fun to see Werner in action. And I've also studied a lot of the a lot of his peers, right? So people like Steve Zaffron, who I don't know that much about, except that he's closely associated with Werner and has written quite a few research papers. I've read those. The Barbados Group, Tracy Goss, The Last Word on Power. That was a great book. A lot of people who worked with Werner, I've read all of their stuff. I've read all of the source material. So Heidegger, Wittgenstein, and really did my best to try and understand that philosophy of ex existentialism and ontology as it related to what Werner was saying. That's 
where like my fascination with Werner is. I've also been privy to listen, just be able to listen to certain personal calls of Werner's with friends of mine where he was giving instruction that was personal. And that was very valuable too. And in fact, what Werner, when I was listening to this one recording, what Werner was talking about was him, he was giving advice on his speaking and how he does it and how he comes in without anything premeditated, you could say, but speaks to the, his words would be their listening to explain what he means by that the paradigm that people are sitting there in the audience with, and he speaks to that paradigm and adds stuff to that paradigm to force them to shift out of the paradigm that they're in if they are so willing to do so. So really interesting stuff. And then on top of that, I studied all of Werner's contemporaries, like the people that developed Lifespring and a bunch of, uh, that's John Hanley, and a bunch of other similar to Aston Landmark programs, large group awareness trainings. And then I actually created a entrepreneurial transformation workshop that got really great results for the people that attended. The, I did it three times with three different transformation leaders in the office that I'm currently renting out. That is that. I would say that there's also, and I'm just throwing this out there because it just occurred to me, and I'm trying to be more present. So anyway, I hope, Jaden, that answered your question about Werner. And for anyone who would like to understand more about Werner and you don't really know that much, first of all, it, all self-help is somewhat derivative of his work, the way it's taught today. And that's a strong statement, but nonetheless, it is true. There is a YouTube video, a four-hour presentation. It's called The Heart of the Matter. And uh, every word that he's using is precise. The first time I heard it, I didn't really understand it completely. I had to study all the things that I just mentioned that I studied, but I could appreciate its power immediately. And then I wanted to understand it more. So if you're interested the heart of the matter, it's on YouTube and it's phenomenal. Okay, so this must be about being present from Michael. For me, it's not so much you not being present. I notice often when your excitement for the subject is there or how fresh it is for you. I appreciate that, Michael, but if you can help me translate that so that is that saying that I should stick to things that are new and fresh for me or stuff that I'm really excited about or what? And Jason, only a couple times you haven't seemed fully engaged. Okay, that's good to go. You never pay a price for previous mistakes when you engage in the present moment. I agree. Gene Carlo. Hey, Rich, what's your recommendation in the thank you pages, the pages after people opting in to sell them on a one-time special offer or a simple thank you for subscribing? Here's your free ebook or what? I would say that it really depends, right? But in general, there's no reason not to have some other action that would be beneficial to you after that opt-in. We talked in Steal Our Winners in early episodes about the benefit of having a self-liquidating offer behind the opt-in page for several reasons. Not only does it help with the subsidizing of the advertising cost, but in particular cases at Agora, when we put a self-liquidating offer in behind a registration, like for a webinar, what we can do is we can actually tell Facebook to optimize for the sale of the self-liquidating offer that raises the cost per lead, but also makes that there's a correlation between people who take the self-liquidating offer and buy on the webinar. So what ends up happening is that you pay more per lead, but you're getting better leads and then you convert more on the webinar. So even though we were paying more for leads, we actually turned a webinar that was losing money into a webinar that was making money because we were paying more for leads that actually converted much better. And that wasn't something I did. That was something that Brandon Ham did, a media buyer at Agora that I interviewed in the very early parts of first month or two of Steal Our Winners. And so that would be my recommendation, Giancarlo. But I would also say that another thing that is probably going to become more popular is if you're familiar with 
Jeremy Blossom's steal our winner contributions of using co-reg. So we're setting up a co-reg process right now with Jeremy, where Jeremy is doing a lead gen campaign where people will get three or four steal our winner interviews for free by opting in. Then on the very next page, there's co-reg and on the co-reg is, and so there's a couple co-reg offers and co-reg offers being like get a free report or get free access or free account on a SaaS application before they get to the next page. And I'll explain what, what is on the next page in a second. But on that intermediary page is these co-reg offers and the co-reg offer that we're going to be testing with is one traffic and funnels, Chris Evans and Taylor Welsh. Another one is Todd Brown with marketing funnel automation. And then another one is Groove, Mike Filsane and John Cornetta. And I think the Morrison brothers and also Ryan Levesque. And so we're going to be testing that. And so each of them are paying on a per co-reg basis, which makes getting the lead for us free and then afterwards those people are then taken to the offer page of steal our winners so we are getting free traffic yet at the same time attempting to sell steal our winners we can tell from the steal our winner sales if the traffic is good and we are testing out whether the other companies traffic and funnels ask method of Vex, right? Marketing funnel automation and groove, like whether they can make that work. If they can make that work, then that would be a really effective model. And I know that Jeremy at StrikePoint, who's doing this with us and we're partners in, is actually creating something like this so that anyone can do this and also then integrating it into Groove so that anyone could be doing co-reg behind their opt-in page to subsidize their advertising costs. Really cool strategy. We went over that strategy and steal our winners in month one or two. And I am very much looking forward to actually it going. And I think we're pretty much there. I've seen all the pages and they look really nice. So I hope Giancarlo, that gives you some ideas great ideas for steal our winners. I think this is another feedback thing. So I'm interested in this. So Gerardo, I am not sure if the difference is that you are not in your mind or not. I think being in your mind shouldn't be the problem as indeed that's what is so unique about you. You really think deeply and thoroughly and a lot. The engaging, not so engaging difference is there though. Okay. So sometimes you are ultra engaging and there are others. I just tune out. That's what I imagine. That's yeah. So that's why I'm asking, could it be more about having a clear train of thought and staying on topic matter versus ranting and being affected by noise in your thinking process? Thank you for reminding me, be present, <laughs> stay in the moment, change it from be present to be grateful. You think it's, a, that's an interesting idea, like grateful that I have this opportunity grateful that you guys are here to listen that could be interesting too i thought you have always been present and engaged i like off script rich unplug yeah look there's no doubt that there have been certain times where i'm less engaging rather than more and i'm trying to understand what that difference is so that i can be my best at this how would you market mindset mental coaching for business owners and the roi of it that's a tough one marcus that's a really tough one what I would say there is that the more you move it to money, selling money at a disc, the more, the easier it's going to be to sell. So I think you'd be better off attacking specific issues that you deal with and being an expert on a few of those issues where people can then self-identify that like that person talks about something that is more useful and more relevant to me as a person. I've already done the thinking in my mind that if I could get rid of X or if I could be better with Y, I would get a much greater outcome. And then your role is to be the expert at X or Y and then attract people who want Y or are trying to get rid of X because they've already done the connecting of the dots that getting rid of those things would make me a lot more money. So I hope that helps, Marcus. Be present with engaging your audience. I get that, John, but am I doing that right now? Or did I do that earlier? Can you notice any kind of difference? That's where I'm going with that. Nina, back in the house. I've been running a book club going through the 30 day challenge in Bond's private group. Oh, okay, so this is the, the Halbert thing. I didn't have the discipline to write out 
the letters by hand. I, I don't doubt that works and works very well. I wrote out one and it took me like three hours and I was like, yeah, that's not going to happen, which is why I've always done the recordings. And if I can, I will play one right now. Just so, you can. so what I would recommend is even if you are going to write them out by hand, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do what Gary recommended because I assume Gary knew what he was talking about. Oh, I have one. And this is Dan Kennedy's wealth attraction. But instead of copying it down by hand, I would read the sales letter out loud. I would make it high speed. And by listening to that over and over again, which I could do a lot faster than writing it out by hand, I could actually memorize the sales letter. I could understand the cadence and it made an impact on me. Warning, this could be the most important information you will ever read about wealth attraction and creating gigantic financial breakthroughs nearly overnight. Discover the little known and never talked about success philosophies, beliefs, thinking, and personal behaviors that allow millionaire and multimillionaire entrepreneurs to attract maximum money and create maximum wealth in record time. If you could change just a few things you think, change a few things about the way you do business, just a few, and suddenly experience a lifting of stress, struggle, anxiety, frustration, and uncertainty, accompanied by a much multiplied influx of cash, a much multiplied influence with others, and accelerated accomplishment of your goals, would you want to at least experiment with those changes? Dear friend, this letter is your invitation to get the at home version of my one time only wealth seminar that I recently conducted on audio or on audio and video tape. And there are reasons you should do that and do it now and then invest a serious amount of time with these materials that transcend the work I'm typically known for. Yes, this is a sales letter. And in this letter, I want to do my level best to convince you to take this action. Here are the things that you must agree are true. One. What's interesting is I remember now that I listened to that over and over again before I wrote The Hidden Obstacles. And I can tell that as I read The Hidden Obstacles, how much I was influenced by that. But listening to something over and over again for me is actually maybe because I'm more of an auditory person and kinesthetic as well, that just writing it out is more kinesthetic, but audio seems to be one of the easiest ways for me to get stuff in. Hope that is helpful. Besides the new traffic sources, how much of online marketing selling has evolved in the last 10 years? A ridiculous amount. There was a time, Francisco, where like the ability to build a funnel was a huge competitive advantage because I had a team and they could build it out, whereas there was no click funnels, there was no groove funnels, there was no, nothing like that quite a bit. And now the tactics are much more advanced as well. So it's certainly not just traffic. It's a lot more. I think there are at least three formats that you are mixing in the same live. And maybe that's what takes a toll on your presence or audience engagement. Level one, ask me anything. Two, teaching day. Three, I'm excited about. Let's chat. Would it help if they happen on clear different dates or at different distinctive moments of the live? That's what I was thinking, Gerard. Like I was thinking that maybe I should have them in segments and these like segments should be consistent. Gaining skills about copywriting, be able to work on any course or book or channels on YouTube, anything to follow or improve myself. If you're going through the Halpert thing, then you're going down the right path. And what I would say is that what a lot of people make the mistake of is not being focused enough when they're learning something. If you're going to follow the 30 day Halpert thing and you're going to do that, then do that. And if you've got more time, then do that even more. But I think you don't want to pull in, you don't want to follow too many people's instructions at any given time. Then you're second guessing, in my opinion, you're second guessing the guru, like what they've laid out for you. And you might be taking in mixed messages by taking in other stuff and it actually, you're doing yourself a disservice. I don't know if that makes sense. We should get back to the, the true believer. Okay, so this was what I was showing you guys the last time. As you can see here, President Dwight Eisenhower recommended as an essential book, Mass Movements, Why They Start, How They Grow, and How They End. It points out that mass movements grow out of frustration and boredom. And that's a critical piece. People have to be frustrated and they need to be bored for a mass movement to begin to gain momentum. And we'll get... We'll circle back into that in a moment or two. A man is likely to mind his own business when it's worth minding. When it's not, he takes his mind off his own meaningless affairs by minding other people's business. They need some crowd to dissolve in to, to relieve their frustration or boredom. If you don't like who you are or how you are or where you are, one of the easiest things to do is to plug into something else. And then that takes over your mind, right? Or gives your mind a thing to focus on. This will become more clear in a second. Leaders step in to seize the frustrations and control the group. Outgrowth of success. Mass movement primarily seems to happen in wealthier countries where people have higher incomes and more leisure, right? And so in other words, 
you could be frustrated, but you're not going to be that frustrated when you are kept fully occupied by making a living, right? If you're fully occupied making a living, you don't have a lot of time for your mind to meander around other things. When you have free time on your hands, that then it operates like a vacuum. It's one of the reasons why there is controversy about putting someone in solitary confinement. When you put someone in solitary confinement, they're, they've got nothing to focus on and very quickly the brain can start playing tricks on someone. If you've got nothing to focus on and you're not in solitary confinement, you can be enrolled in a movement to get to alleviate that frustration and boredom. So here's a quote from the book. Freedom aggravates at least as much as it alleviates frustration. Freedom of choice places the whole blame of failure on the shoulders of the individual. And there's a lot of truth to that, right? The more free you are to choose, the more you have yourself to blame when you're not where you want to be. Mass movements project the anger on the other rather than the self. They are the opposite of 100% responsibility. So when you see in copywriting, it's not your fault. I think that's amateurish, right? Ideally, you want the prospect to come to that conclusion on their own. But either way, right, we're taking the anger off of the self and the and that is credibly important, right? It's important for lots of reasons as it relates to marketing, but the first and foremost, and this is really important, and this is something I learned from Dan Kennedy, we're dealing with a self-esteem problem very often when we're in the marketing game. So it's not enough for many prospects out there for you to prove that you've done it. It's not even enough for you to prove that you've done it for others because a lot of people will feel like maybe they are not capable of getting a specific outcome. So in order to sell someone on a product, a program that helps deliver a specific result, they have to believe that it's not only that it's one possible for them and then two with your help it is probable or your product probable for them hence moving someone from possible to probable is part of the game of marketing and i hope that makes sense there's a tendency to locate the shaping forces of our existence outside ourselves success and failure are unavoidably related in our minds with the state of things around us. Hence it is that people with a sense of fulfillment think it's a good world and would like to conserve it as is, while the frustrated favor radical change. We avoid taking responsibility on the plus side as well as the negative side. It is understandable that those who fail should incline to blame the world for their failure. The remarkable thing is the successful do too, right? And we see that all the time when you, when they interview someone who is successful, a lot of times they'll say they were lucky. And when they're saying they're lucky, what they're really ascribing is to external factors, right? The powerful can be as timid as the weak, right? And that's where we were talking about the new poor last week. They must know how to kindle and fan extravagant hope. That is the creator of of a movement and same with marketing right part of marketing is tapping into rekindling of hope the difference between conservative and radical seems to spring mainly from their attitude towards the future fear of the future causes us to lean against and cling to the present while renders us receptive to change but also belittles the present just for those who might not be familiar so what we're looking at here are my notes. And oftentimes the first time I go through, I will bold the parts that mean the most to me. And then when I go through this again, I will highlight. And then after I highlight, if I go through it again, I will then consolidate those highlights and then I will write up my thoughts on it. So for men to plunge headlong into an undertaking of vast change, they must be intensely discontent, yet not destitute, and they must have the feeling that by possession of some potent doctrine, 
ineffable leader or some new technique, they have access to a source of irresistible power. They must also have extravagant conception of the prospects and potentialities of the future. Finally, they must be wholly ignorant of the difficulties involved in their vast undertaking. Experience is a handicap. I'd say as this applies to marketing, we would scale it back a little bit. It doesn't need to be that much, right? But they do have to be discontent with the current, right? They also can't be destitute or they can't buy your products, right? And so they have to believe that there's something that you're providing, something that you're giving them, something that you're offering them in your offer that's going to make the difference. That's not going to be maybe the source of some irresistible power, but is certainly at least enough that will get them an outcome that up until that point has eluded them. There is a fundamental difference between the appeal of a mass movement and the appeal of a practical organization. The practical organization offers opportunities for self-advancement and its appeal is mainly to self-interest, okay? On the other hand, a mass movement really appeals to those who crave to be rid of an unwanted self. A mass movement attracts and holds a following, not because it can satisfy the desire for self-advancement, but because it can satisfy the passion for self-renunciation. In other words, to be reborn, to separate themselves from who they were to being someone different note at the root of self at the root of mass movements is always self-loathing of some form faith in a holy cause is to a considerable extent a substitute for the lost faith in ourselves the less justified a man is in claiming excellence for his own self, the more ready he is to claim all excellence for his nation, his religion, his race, or his holy cause. I think that's a very powerful statement. A man is likely to mind his own business when it's worth minding. When it is not, he takes his mind off his own meaningless affairs by minding other people's business. What looks like giving a hand is often holding on for dear life. The despair brought by unemployment comes not only from the threat of destitution, but from the sudden view of a vast nothingness ahead, like how are you going to spend your time? So back to my midlife crisis, right? I felt that, that I felt the vast nothingness ahead, right? But for very different reasons. I had achieved all my goals. I wasn't happy. Like now what? Same vast nothingness ahead. I can't do more of the same. More of the same hadn't led me to the promised land. And that was the challenge. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? The unemployed are more likely to follow the peddlers of hope than the handers out of relief. When people are ripe for mass movements, they're usually ripe for any effective movement. Bernie or Trump are the same in some ways. Since all mass movements draw their adherence from the same type of humanity and appeal to the same types of mind, A, all mass movements are competitive with one another, and the gain in one is a loss of another for the other and that all mass movements to some extent are interchangeable because if someone is trying to abandon their former self, it doesn't really matter what they abandon their former self for as long as they can abandon their former self. The problem of stopping a mass movement is often a matter of substituting one movement for another. A social revolution can be stopped by promoting a religious or nationalist movement. Thus, in countries where Catholicism has recaptured its mass movement spirit, it counteracts the spread of communism. And that makes total sense to me. The game of history is usually played by the best and the worst over the heads of the majority in the middle. That makes sense too. Sociopaths and losers steer the ship. The reason that the inferior elements of a nation can exert a marked influence on its course is that they are wholly without reverence towards the present. They see their lives and the present as spoiled beyond remedy, and they are ready to waste and wreck both. Hence, their reckless to chaos and anarchy. They also crave to dissolve their spoiled, meaningless selves in some soul-stirring, spectacular communal undertaking, hence their proclivity for united action. It is usually those whose poverty is relatively recent, the new poor, who throb with the ferment of frustration. The memory of better things is as fire in their veins. They are dis inherited and dispossessed who respond to every rising movement where people toil from sunrise to sunset for a bare living they nurse no grievance and dream no dream right they're just too busy making a living so when someone is too busy making a living they are not 
they don't have the downtime to be as frustrated and to ponder it being so different. Note, why countries tend to become democratic at a certain GDP per capita, there is sufficient time to be an activist. De Tocqueville, right, that's the gentleman from France who came to the U.S. and wrote about the U.S. in the early late 1700s or whatever, early 1800s, I don't remember. De Tocqueville and his research into the state of society in France before the revolution was struck by the discovery that in no one of the periods which have followed the revolution of 1789 has the no national prosperity of France augmented more rapidly than it did the 20 years preceding that event. In other words, that in the 20 years before the French Revolution, there was more national prosperity and more people gaining more freedom and more income than before than after. In that before, that gave people more time to ponder what was possible and then be more, have more disdain for the present. The French found their position, the more intolerable, the better it became. That's the irony. That's the, that is the counterintuitive part of this, that people have to, to for dissatisfaction to stir up behavior, there has to be a certain level of progress or a certain level of freedom, or it doesn't have time to really grow roots. It is not actual suffering, but the taste of better things, which excites people to revolt. Our frustration is greater when we have much and want more than when we have nothing and want some. We dare more when striving for superfluities than for necessities. Often when we renounce superfluities, we end up lacking in necessities. Every established mass movement has its distant hope, its brand of dope, to dull the impatience of the masses and reconcile them with their lot in life. Freedom aggravates at least as much as it alleviates frustration. All blame a failure on the shoulders of the individual. Unless a man has the talents to make something of himself, freedom is an irksome burden. We join a mass movement to escape individual responsibility, to be free from freedom. The adherents of a rising movement have a strong sense of liberation, even though they live and breathe in an atmosphere of strict adherence to tenets and commands. This sense of liberation comes from having escaped the burdens, fears, and hopelessness of an individual existence. It is this escape which they feel as a deliverance of redemption. Note, the feeling of actually being free is terror for those who don't know how to handle it. Those who see their lives as spoiled and wasted crave equality and fraternity more than they do freedom. If they clamor for freedom, it is but freedom to establish equality and uniformity. Those who clamor loudest for freedom are often the ones least likely to be happy in a free society. Where freedom is real, equality is the passion of the masses. Where equality is real, freedom is the passion of a small minority. Without freedom creates a more stable social pattern than freedom without equality. This, I'm hoping that makes sense because that's a very powerful paragraph. When freedom is real, when everyone is free, equality can really stir the passion of the masses. When equality is real, when everyone's the same, freedom is the passion of just a small minority. And the reason why is that equality without freedom creates a more stable social pattern than freedom without equality. Because freedom without equality leads to people being dissatisfied with their lives because it could have been different, and they're aware of that because of the freedom. Hopefully that makes sense. Poverty, when coupled with creativeness, is usually free of frustration. Nothing so bolsters our self-confidence and reconciles us with ourselves as the continuous ability to create, to see things grow and develop under our hands. With a fading of the individual's creative powers, there appears to be a pronounced inclination towards joining a mass movement, right? Like it sucks to be a writer who's not writing or a artist that's not creating. Note anti-localist. It relies on weak local ties. All the advantages brought by the West are ineffectual substitutes for the sheltering and soothing anonymity 
of a communal existence. Even when the westernized native attains personal success, becomes rich, or masters a respected profession, he is not happy. He feels naked and orphaned. The Western colonizing powers offer the native the gift of individual freedom and independence. They try to teach him self-reliance. What it all actually amounts to is individual isolation. And so this is where, if you read the book Tribes, I believe it was Tribes, where they talk about how in the early colonial days of the United States that there were no Indians that joined the Americans who really stayed there. But there were many Americans who joined the natives and enjoyed their life much more so. But that communal existence it has drawing power, right? We all want to be part of a winning team. And being part of a winning team is much more fulfilling than being a winner by yourself. Hence, Lots of self-development world as well also come with a community attached to it. And that this is part of the reason people are looking for a place to join. They're looking for a place to plug in. They're looking to be a part of something bigger than just themselves. And that brings people a sense of comfort and being alone, even being successful alone can bring discomfort. The employer whose only purpose is to keep his workers at their task and get all he can out of them is not likely to attain his goal by dividing them, playing off one worker against the other. It is rather in his interest that the worker should feel themselves part of a whole, preferably a whole which comprises the employer too. Experience shows that production is at its best when the workers feel and act as members of a team. Any policy that disturbs and tears apart the team is bound to cause severe trouble. Incentive wages, plans that offer bonuses to individual workers, do more harm than good. Group incentive plans in which the bonus is based on the work of the whole team, including the four men, are much more likely to promote greater productivity and greater satisfaction on the part of workers. Now, I could see how some of you might disagree with that because certainly playing workers off each other, like having a leaderboard, for example, for your salespeople is somewhat effective. However, what's even more effective is when the whole team is rooting for, is on the same page, right? And that's one of the ways that I've always tried to grow my businesses by putting in aggressive profit sharing and things like that, which now, and now I'll have to begin thinking about as well, because we're adding people to our team and I don't like winning in a vacuum. When de Tocqueville says a tyrannical government is true of all totalitarian orders, their moment of greatest danger is when they begin to reform. That is to say, when they begin to show liberal tendencies, because that opens up the space, right? Where people have more time and therefore more freedom. China is in danger when the CCP begins to reform. Those who try to write, paint, compose, etc., and fail decisively, and those who, after tasting the elation of creativeness, feel a drying up of the creative flow within and know that never again will they produce aught worthwhile are alike in the grip of desperate passion. Neither fame, nor power, nor riches, nor even monumental achievements in other fields can still their hunger. Their unappeased hunger persists, and they are likely to become the most violent services of their holy cause. Unlimited opportunities can be as potent a cause of frustration as a paucity of or lack of opportunities. When opportunities are apparently unlimited, there is an inevitable depreciation of the present. The attitude is all that I'm doing or possibly can do is chicken feed compared with what is left undone. Thus, it is to be expected that the least and most successful of a minority bent on assimilation should be the most responsive to appeal of a processizing mass movement. There is perhaps no more reliable indicator of a society's ripeness for a mass movement than the prevalence of unrelieved boredom. Note, this is not me, this is the notes of the author. I was radical in college because I didn't see any greater challenges or opportunities. The consciousness of a barren, meaningless existence is the main fountainhead of boredom. 
The differentiated individual is free of boredom only when he is engaged either in creative work or some absorbing occupation, or when he is wholly engrossed in the struggle. Pleasure chasing and dissipation are ineffective palliatives. Self-surrender, which is, as will be shown in part three, the source of mass movements, unity and vigor, is a sacrifice, an act of atonement, and clearly no atonement is called for unless there is a poignant sense of sin. Here, as elsewhere, the techniques of mass movement or with a malady and then offer the movement as a cure. And this is what I was talking about as we were ending the last live stream. The idea that if you were to like take a look at the entrepreneurial emergency or the Internet Business Manifesto, two of the free reports I've written, what you'll find is that I'm closing down any hope that of the current way of operating. At the same time, I'm offering newfound hope of a new way. Part of the reason for the success of those documents is that point, right? That I am shutting down the likelihood of success in the current way, then leading someone to a crossroads where they choose the new way. And then at some point in both of those documents, you'll see that it's as if I assume that you've chosen the new way because everything that I'm writing now to you is as someone who has chosen, has been at that crossroads and chosen the right way. And now we are the same and I'm talking to you about how to do this right. So I'm taking it as a given, right? That what you've decided is the right decision and that if you were choosing to stay with the old way, you could close the report and not read any further because I'm writing it to you as someone who has already chosen to go down this new path with me, which leads to the purchase. Let me know what you guys think. And we've got about 25 minutes left in saying, keep going. Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. So let's go back to this. All right. An effective mass movement cultivates the idea of sin. It depicts the autonomous self, not only as barren and helpless, but also vile. To confess and repent is to slough off one individual's distinctiveness and separateness, and salvation is found by losing oneself in the holy oneness of the congregation. I wouldn't go as that far in a marketing sense, but I could see that in a mass movement. The vigor of a mass movement stems from the propensity of its followers for united action and self-sacrifice. When we ascribe the success of a movement to its faith, doctrine, propaganda, leadership, ruthlessness, and so on, we are but referring to the instruments of the unification and to means used to inculcate a readiness for self-sacrifice. It is perhaps impossible to understand the nature of mass movements unless it is recognized that their chief preoccupation is to foster, perfect, and perpetuate a facility for united action and self-sacrifice. The important in the poignantly frustrated the propensities for united action and self-sacrifice arise spontaneously. What ails the frustrated? It is the consciousness of an irredeemably blemished self. Their chief desire is to escape that self, and it is this desire which manifests itself in a propensity for united action and self-sacrifice. So, to induce and encourage an estrangement from the self. Okay, so... I'd imagine this, right? I write the Internet Business Manifesto. I divide the world of Internet marketers up into opportunity seekers and strategic entrepreneurs. And I make all the problems of Internet marketing that people experience symptoms of being a opportunity seeker. People see themselves, therefore, as a opportunity seeker the way I saw myself as someone with ADD. The, then the report leads people to a crosstail, leads them to that crossroads. And then now for the rest of the report, it's writing to someone who wants to be a strategic entrepreneur. Then I do my weekly Q and A's right for the business growth system and have countless people introduce themselves as a reformed opportunity seeker, estrangement from prior self, right? They've now labeled their former self and now they want distance from it. And you see how powerful that can be.
that identification of self and uh, and therefore casting prior results to that former self. Okay, so to illustrate a principle, says Bhagat, you must exaggerate much and you must omit much. And so this is something that is important. So a lot of times when people would ask me about how do I approach writing a report, I would tell people that it's, I would tell people it's similar to the way Michael Moore would do his movies, right? So I have an agenda. I have a outcome that I'm trying to lead people to. I'm trying to create this kind of grease slide to the epiphany. And I feel like that's the same way that Michael Moore shoots his documentaries. As all documentaries always seem to have a slant and kind of suppress some information, bring up other information, right? He has no purpose, worth, and destiny apart from his collective body. And as long as that body lives, he cannot really die. Okay. He must never feel alone, though stranded on a desert island. He must still f feel that he's under the eyes of the group. To be cast out from the group should be the equivalent of being cut off from life. We are a tribal species in a post-tribal society. This is the source of many problems. I totally agree with that. The people who stood up best in the Nazi concentration camps were those who felt themselves members of a compact party, the communists or the church. Note Frankel's sense of purpose. The ghetto of the Middle Ages was for the Jews more of a fortress than a prison. Without the sense of utmost unity and distinctness, which the ghetto imposed upon them, they could not have endured with unbroken spirit the violence and abuse of those dark centuries. And that makes lots of sense to me. Note, important to always have multiple subcultures that verse identity. The same Russians who cringe and crawl before Stalin's secret police displayed unsurpassed courage when facing singly or in a group, the invading Nazis. The reason for this contrasting behavior is not that Stalin's police are more ruthless than Hitler's armies, but that when facing Stalin's police, the Russians feel a mere individual, while when facing the Germans, he saw himself a member of a mighty race possessed of a glorious past and even more glorious future. That should make a lot of sense for people. So here we're talking about Russians. When they, were, they couldn't stand up to Stalin, they were individuals with that right? However, Russians as a collective were standing up to the Nazis. And so they were part of Russia. And because of that, whether they were alone or in a group, they had more courageousness, more willingness to act. Same person, but seeing themselves very differently based on who the enemy was. And that's why a common enemy is so powerful in marketing. It's that common enemy that can then, when done correctly, puts us as a part of a collective against. Lakoff's point, and this is George Lakoff, and George Lakoff is someone to study, especially metaphors of the mind and things like that. You need to animate people with this. Maybe the ideal is to show them that it is merely a drama and they are players on the stage. There can be no genuine depreciation or deprecation of the present without assured hope of the future. All mass movements deprecate the present by depicting it as a mean to a glorious future. All right. So that's where I left off. So I'm going to put these notes in the Facebook group once I'm done with them. So I think we're probably going to have to work on this on Thursday, although I will advance them a much more. Let's see. Amazing insight on frustration and boredom. I think so. And that's why I love this book. Thank you, Rich. Very interesting point about giving people hope for change it reminds me of step in the 16 world sales letter. Yeah, definitely. Rich from Stefan, this reminds me, did you see the movie Parasite? What are your thoughts on it? I haven't seen it. It explores a gap between the bottom of the pyramid and the capitalistic. Their point, but can't help but look at that way of thinking that represented there is an excuse to play the victim card. Persuasive that for a couple of hours, I fell into a type of thinking that could clearly see how many people of today, including a bunch of my high school friends, support socialism and communism until I found a way out of it mentally and got back on track. It's so easy to play the victim card, especially when circumstances actually heavily support the mental lack of taking responsibility that's toxic. The concepts of this book seem to apply here. Oh, I would agree with that. Sid, abandoning one's former self, the problem is abandoning versus making own change. I would agree with that. Sid super, Tim said that's powerful. Reformed opportunity seeker, identification about chasing money, making opportunities versus a real strategic business person. And I totally get that, but understand how powerful 
for me with my clients to have them see themselves in one identity and me helping them move from, from one identity to another identity and how powerful that can be on retention on a lot of other things. I'm answering Francisco, like who's my coaching for? And I saw another question in there just about BGS in general. Steal our winners is all about the tactics, right? Those tactics can support any online business model and or overall type of online business. Most coaching programs out there are dependent on the model. Steal our winners sits below that because it's tactics that fit into any model. My coaching program, it's agnostic to the model because you as the entrepreneur have to make decisions and those decisions are going to impact the performance of the model. I've been very effective at helping people just become much better entrepreneurs. In other words, how you see the world determines your actions and behaviors. Most people do not have the world show up for them. A successful entrepreneur has the world show up for them. And that takes a lot of time when left on your own to see the world in that way. There are ways to really advance that, to make you a much better entrepreneur to make sure that you're building your business around your strengths and that you're making your weaknesses irrelevant, that you are building the right team and that you know what type of people will build that right team versus not. So anyway, that wraps this session. I'm always very comfortable in live video, but just because I'm comfortable doesn't mean I'm performing at my best. And I wanna get better and better at this.